You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by NASDAQ. From its inception, NASDAQ has been an innovator and agent of change in the financial markets. It's in our DNA. From the development of electronic trading, to our drive to bring enhanced functionality and world-leading technology to our suite of six options exchanges, we exemplify customer focus, consistent technology, and streamlined solutions. Now NASDAQ is proud to launch the NASDAQ 100 Volatility Index, ticker symbol VOLQ, to its suite of exchange indexes. VOLQ uses only at-the-money options to provide a precise measure of NASDAQ 100 volatility. Learn more about this exciting new volatility product at www.nasdaq.com slash VOLQ. NASDAQ, leading the U.S. options market and continually rewriting tomorrow. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means we are back to kick off a fun, exciting new year. A volatility views. My name, of course, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever scintillating, ever compelling, at least we tend to think so, Options Insider Radio Network. I want to thank all of you out there who helped contribute to make 2022 the most ridiculous year in the history of the network. And again, this January now, this month is our 16 year anniversary. So insane. We got to plan some sort of fun celebration for that but yes the the numbers are off the charts we want to thank all of you out there who continue to drive up our bandwidth bills it's a good problem to have <laughs> so uh, fun times thanks to all of you remember if you like what you hear do keep rating and reviewing on your platform of choice it clearly does have a correlation with how many new people are continuing to discover this show and indeed the network after 16 plus freaking years it's crazy but uh, there are still new folks to find it. So leave a review if you like what you hear. And, of course, if you want to go above and beyond, welcome, of course, to all you new folks who joined us in the pro just in the last few weeks. It's been uh, fun to see all the new faces out there. And congrats to our winner of our pro trading crate. We gave it away yesterday on the old OB program. Check out that show if you or check out our Twitter if you want to see who won over there. If you want to be a winner next time, if you want to win the January crate. Remember, each one is a completely bespoke custom job. Just for you, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. That also gets you options oddities immediately after this show and a whole bunch more for you guys to sink your teeth into. Let's see who's joining me today to sink their teeth into this volatility feast that we have prepared for us in the new year. First, let's go out for the first time in the new year to the southern volatility mecca where we are joined once again by the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian from optionpit.com. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to Volatility Views and Happy New Year to you, sir. 
Yeah, happy new year, Mark. It's uh, gl- happy to be here. We've had a interesting week of trading, and I'm looking forward to uh, digging in with you. A lot to dig in, and also joining us today to kick off the new year. I thought it'd be fun to have the once future and now present Dr. Vix joining us via that magic technology, unbelievably high-tech stuff, bleeding edge, known as the telephone. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to Volatility Boom Sure. Yes, on the phone. Maybe a New Year's resolution for you as we can get all the all the tech bells and whistles sorted out. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Well, I, I got a new laptop for Christmas. I'm still working on it. And <laughs> I'm far, I am farther south than Mr. Sebastian today. Where are you I'm today? In New Orleans, Louisiana. Oh, is there looking a, out is, the window at looking out the window at Bourbon Street right now? Oh, is that a vacation or is there some ball event going on in the New Year that I'm not aware of? In in the years that you've known me, have I ever gone on a vacation? Uh, I think maybe that that storm chasing thing. I think you like that. Yeah, no, that was about it. Yeah, that's, a, that's something my kids want to do. My kids don't want to come to New Orleans. No, there's a there's a really big academic conference they hold every year. Um, the first weekend of the year, right before we all start back. So a huh. um, bunch of Nobel Prize guys down here talking, et cetera. It's a, a ASSA, which incorporates uh, thousands of academics from all over the world. Oh, maybe you'll have some fun uh, vol insight to share with us from the conference. A New Year's hangover in New Orleans. I guess there are worse things. <laughs> that city <laughs> perpetually in party mode. I don't care if it's Tuesday at noon over there in New Orleans. As we keep on rolling, this show always in party mode. So let's keep on rolling right on into the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Review, the portion of the show where we break down the week that was and indeed still is from a vol trading and trending and analysis and unusual activity perspective. And you know what? We'll get to all that fun in a second, what's lighting up the tape right now. But because this is our first chance to chat with both of these fellows in the new year, we haven't really had a chance to pick their brains on their thoughts for the end of last year, a topsy-turvy, tumultuous, call it what you will, year last year from a vol, from a markets, from an overall options perspective. A record volume year, just all sorts of madness, big sell-offs in the major indices, maybe not the vol responses perhaps you wanted out there, a lot to unpack. So let's go around the horn before we get into the current vol activity and just look back a little bit at what were maybe the highlights, the trends, the trades, the developments that stand out to you from the mad year that was 2022, from a vol and options and every other perspective. Mr. Rhodes, you are our guest, and we have no idea how long the, the phone lines will hold out there in New Orleans. So let's start with you, sir. What really resonates to you from the mad vol year that was 2022, sir? Well, it, I, and I think if you did, I don't know if you did a survey on this or not, but I, I think the number one thing in the vol space is really that we didn't get over 40. That, that you would expect that we would have gotten over 40. And I think that was, uh, uh, everybody was sitting around, wait, maybe they're still waiting for it, waiting for, for the spike in volatility that signals the all clear to buying stocks. Um, but yeah, the muted response in VIX, I think, is the number one story. And, and we all have theories on it, but nobody's quantitatively proven that it's because we got a lot more options available. Yeah, it's kind of hard to uh, dismiss yeah. that one as one of the top stories of the year. In fact, as we're recording, our final show for the end of the year last year, a market watch came out with a story that effectively said, is VIX broken? Was it broken this year? So that drumbeat has persisted throughout the entirety. It started off and we started to get those sell-offs earlier in the year. And we didn't really see perhaps as much upside as some folks were looking for. We did polls throughout the year. Do we really need that big VIX pop, that big VIX explosion to signal? the capitulation out there in the broad market. We we asked you folks, you folks thought we needed something, at least as you mentioned, Russell, at least over 40. That seemed to be the consensus. VIX had to really get over 40 before they signaled that the end was nigh, that the market had conceded. Some folks 
got out there. They wanted 50, 60, 80 even out there. But the the vast majority of you said, yeah, we at least need to get up to over 40. And we didn't even get there last year. So there is a, a strong a strong consensus, it seems like, behind that one. I'd be curious to see if any – I mean, it might be a little early for that, but I'd be curious to see if your academic – Affair has any sort of insight into that. Uh, Mr. Meatball, same question for you. As you look back on the mad, insane year that was 2022, what were the standouts for you, sir? Yeah, I mean, I think that to Russell's point, yeah, all these options maybe are affecting VIX. The lack of of real fear that ever hit the market, I think, is really compelling and interesting. Um, the uh, death of skew. I think is another th- thing that we could p- maybe touch on. Nobody's buying out of the money options anymore. It seems like, uh, and you know, it's all about what the what these da- the way these daily options have turned uh, volume upside down and money flows. So that that's what I I think really stands out for what happened in 2022. Well, listeners, I'd be curious for you folks. We probably should put that out as a question of the week. What are your vol stories? Your takeaways from 2022. The muted response to VIX is definitely a big one. A couple of other ones that we discussed on the show last week, of course. Uh, we had one seemingly dominant trend in VIX flow last year, which is, of course, the never-ending explosion of upside. It seemed like everyone and their mother and their uncle and their hedge fund all discovered the magic of not just, let's say, the VIX 40s or 50s, which we would traditionally consider to be upside type trades no they they went above and beyond this past year we were talking 70s 80s pars and well above 110s 115s 125s uh you name the quote-unquote outlandish strike and chances are it had some oi last year so this was or should say last year really was the year that much of the market really seemed to awaken to this i would love maybe Again, going back to your conference, Mr. Mr. Once in Future Dr. Mix, I would love to see maybe was there an academic paper that kicked this off? Was there it seemed like some funds discovered it and then a whole bunch of others just followed in their wake and everyone could not get enough of the upside this year. Would you concur with that, Mr. Once in Future Dr. Mix? And maybe at your event, maybe you'll hear some interesting research as to why so. Oh, good God. At this event, we're not going to hear research on what happened in 2022 until 2027. Um, the academic world doesn't move nearly as quick as as we would like it to. Um, so no, that's not that that that, that, that nobody's going to investigate that one. I am working with a student who's thinking about doing it as their dissertation, um, and we're we're exploring just uh, some various ways to try to prove that it's it's possibly the short dated options. And I do think what happened with the short dated options is uh, more and more people. We're looking shorter and shorter term. Uh, you know, in my in, in my time with EQ Derivatives, we do out we did outreaches, and one of the big things that people were looking to make money on in 2022 was short term trend, which is professional speak for day trading, and uh, we see a ton of day trading um, or one the less than one day or one day trades in the index options. Uh, it's dominating that market now. Which is definitely it's got to be sucking something away from from the other from the longer date of volatility. And then the the thing that Mark mentioned about skew, um, I, I with respect to skew dying last year. Well, if you look at the performance of the the SIBO's five percent put index, the one where it consistently buys the five percent out of the money put on the S and P five hundred and owns the portfolio. Um, I don't know how it ended for the year, but I know periodically it was underperforming buy and hold. So when you see something like that, and it, and, and that starts to resonate throughout the markets, uh, people start to look elsewhere for hedging, and or looking for you know not not giving up as much time value when you're hedging, or using spreads instead of outright put purchases. But I think the underperformance of that index is just indicated that you have to do something else to protect yourself. And that's what, what happened to skew. Yeah. You know, that, that was another takeaway from last year that it was challenging to hedge yourself. I mean, if you had a nice put on in, let's say the S and P early into mid Q1, you captured some of those aggressive down moves. You probably did all right. But the rest of the year, as Russell pointed out, it was extremely challenging to really make money 
with those hedges and whether you bought them at the points where the skew was elevated. And so he just was, it was a challenge on the outset or you just didn't get the bang on the downside that you were hoping for when you bought them initially, maybe a combo of the two, uh, whatever the case was. This was a year a lot of people, I think, learned that you can't just go buy a put and set it and forget it. You have to do more, whether it spreads or whether you have to maybe adjust your strategy. Maybe, as Russell said, maybe bring that a little bit closer to home so you're not spending as much money for these things. You have to do something to reduce that outlay because that's going to come back to bite you. But the other big trend that Russell alluded to, which is kind of inescapable from last year, and it really kicked in in Q3 into Q4, so it definitely was a latter half of the year trend, was this this zero DTE takeover. It's all anybody can freaking talk about on the institutional side, it seems like these days. It has taken one of the most storied legacy options products for institutions, the SPX, and turned it almost completely on its head in just a span of six or so months. Uh, I just pulled up the numbers yesterday on the option block. I'm sure if I did it again today, it would be similar. The top 20 most active contracts in SPX yesterday during Showtime, all 20 were zero DTE. If you expanded that to the top 40 most actives, I think it was 35 or 36 of them (laughs) were zero DTE. So of the top 40 most active contracts in one of the biggest options products on the planet, (laughs) <laughs> it was zero DTE. So even the funds are getting in on that trend. So you're right, Russell. That That is still, a, to me, I think, one of the big takeaways from last year and still the big wild card. We don't know. This is still very new. We have no idea how such a dramatic shakeup and such a big product, which, of course, is where VIX is derived from, listeners, how that's going to impact things like VIX going forward because no one's ever done this before. And you're right, the the academics are way too slow for our taste. So we'll have to just commission it here on the practical sense. But Mark, I know you've been a convert to this. You kind of only trade zero DTE in the SPX now. So uh, what are your thoughts on that trend exploding last year, uh, the shakeup we saw in SPX as a result, and perhaps going forward into this new year of 2023, what do you think that's going to mean for things like VIX going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to have to take a hard look at how they calculate VIX because I don't think that there's any doubt that if somebody is buying, you know, if all this volume is in those front dated contracts, that when I can basically trade the next day or the day of um, non-farm payrolls or CPI, that that isn't going to that that shortening of duration is not going to have a dramatic effect on the way the VIX moves. Um, there's the uh, I forget what's the symbol for the short term VIX now uh, the seven day. Um, B- Bix is nine D. It's a nine day one, but uh, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, it's a terrible symbol. Yeah, that I mean so. that is going to be <laughs> that might be your better your better indicator for where vol is, but even that might not uh, give you what you want because. Um, you know, we've just uh, all of this volume is so near dated um, They're They need to they're going to need to take a hard look at how uh, how all of this is affecting VIX and volatility and what it means for volatility futures in, in the future. Well, and it, it, now I'm going to speak slowly because I'm trying to bring up a spreadsheet of some work that I've been doing. Uh, I actually priced out. At the money SPX um, straddles every every day last year that we had one uh, that that options were expiring the next day I priced them on the close and the initial stats are kind of interesting I'm just trying to where's my there is SPX one day straddles uh, we had 220 um, expirations last year and 220 days where there was an expiration for a PM expiration for uh, SPX. And on average, um, I, I should make you guys guess, what do you think the average range that was being priced in by uh, one-day options on the SPX was last year? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's, lower than, it's lower than I thought it would be. Uh, I'm going to say, let me guess. I'm going to say 22. Well, it's a one-day move. So on average, it, the the value of a straddle on the close for SPX when they had options expiring the next day, it indicated a 1.17% move. 
Oh, in percent. Oh, percent. Oh. <laughs> oh, in percent. Sorry, I didn't. I know I didn't. I didn't answer the way. Yeah, you guys. Implied volatility doesn't work for a one-day option. No, no. In my mind. So was, that's why I was so, saying. So, I wasn't giving you know. vol. I was giving you the actual points. Um, yeah. yeah. No. I. I um, and well, and it varies because the um, the level. But you know, if the if the average, let's just say the average for SPX last year was like thirty seven, thirty eight hundred. Uh, that would be pricing in about a 40 point move. Oh, wow. Each day. And the range was as high as 2.4% and as low as half a percent, just depending on what's going on. There's a huge range on what the straddles are pricing in. And you can see that, like that 2.4%, that, that, uh, that actually occurred, that was actually priced the day before the December uh, Fed meeting. <laughs> that was the highest one of the year, <laughs> uh, the wow. day before wow. the, uh, the final FOMC meeting. So, I'm uh, sorry. I, I just, I know, I just completely hijacked the program, and I'll. No, we uh, love data uh, points like that. We were, talking, we were talking about one day options, and I. Ju- this is just something that I'm. I'm going to put out in a white paper. Um, I, I just happen to have that number, those numbers right in front of me. Right. How I like to show numbers. Given the moves we've seen, especially at post Fed meetings, you think, yeah, mm-hmm. two less than two percent <laughs> is is light. Uh, yeah. I, I would have guessed closer to two, but but under two. Uh, but one point one seven kind of surprised me. And also, the average move, day to day move last year in the S and P five hundred was one point three percent. So the options, on average, underpriced. That yeah, they're, they're, we could do a whole program on it. Maybe we'll do a pro Q and A on it after I write it up. There we go. See, you need to kick off the academic literature. Don't don't wait for these other schmoes to spend the next six years looking back at twenty twenty two. We need to do it now, Mister Rhodes. The people are demanding it. They want it. Uh, there. I got to share one thing that somebody said to me today at the conference, and this is why I, I had an academic uh, ask because he he knew me from the SIBO days. He said, I, "I'm watching the markets, and I really do feel like uh, customer order flow is what moves implied volatility around." <laughs> <laughs> and he's like and he's like 70 he's been around for 50 years um he said that, and and yeah i know we kind of giggle and you know what i'll guarantee you that, and i don't want to insult the listeners but i bet you two-thirds of listeners are like oh what did he just say well we always talk about how how the market makers change their implied volatility input and he interpreted that as they picked the implied volatility well they changed their inputs based on order flow which is the custom order flow, but yeah, was, there's no input in the ac- on a big study to prove that. <laughs> there's no input in the academic models for customer flow. Why would you consider such a thing, Mister Rhodes? Yes, there's a reason why we don't have a lot of pure academics on the network uh, for things like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, the the things that are new to them, they've just discovered in their seven decade career, are, are things I think a lot of our average listeners would already understand empirically, even if they don't say it. Out loud. Speaking of our listeners out there understanding things, we have Nichols in our chat. He says he thinks zero DTE is breaking the VIX. You know, you may have a point, Nichols. We're kind of debating that right now. I think the the takeaway from that is no one really knows yet. Uh, this is a very new phenomenon. I don't think if he had told me at the beginning of this year that SPX would be turned on its head by the end of or beginning of last year, I should say, and SPX would be turned on its head by the end of the year and pretty much all of the volume would be all expiring same day and all of a sudden every day would be expiration day in the SPX and dogs and cats would be living together and mass hysteria and there'd be retail flocking into SPX and big funds would all be trading same day. I would have said you were a crazy person and I would have been horribly wrong because that's exactly what we have right now. So there is no hard data on this yet. There is no studies as we just talked about. This is still a very new phenomenon. So it could very well be playing a part in why People seem definitely to come away from last year with just the just the takeaway, whether it was just in their gut, whether they had some data underlining it, that VIX didn't respond the way they thought it should. And so maybe this is is one of the reasons for it. It certainly is a factor, like I said, a wild card that we don't really fully understand the impact of. And that'll be something I'll be looking forward to this year as we look ahead to 2023 of kind of coming to grips with this phenomenon a little more. A lot of people think it's going to expand to other categories let's say your your single names i don't think we're going to quite get there yet for the reasons i said before occ seems to be pumping the brakes on that uh so we're not going to see your apple and your tesla also those are not cash settled so that's another issue you have shares changing hands after hours and things that 
maybe gum up the works a little bit. The cash settle thing for SPX makes it fit very nicely into this zero DTE thing. So I think we'll see other indexes pick it up. But single names, I don't think we're quite there yet. But again, if this trend continues, the exchanges are not fools. They see money. Why trade one contract a week when you could trade five? That's more money. (laughs) So they will find a way to make that happen, in which case... Yeah, all bets are off. This is uh, an intriguing time to be looking about at vol, I should say. I know I said that every year, kicking off the year. Let's hope for a quieter year. But so far, things are, are very interesting, very topsy-turvy. Speaking of how things are halfway through the show here now, let's get to how things are moving and shaking right now. Been an interesting first week to the new year. Kind of started off kind of in the red. And then we tried to fight it. Then we went back into the red again. And now today, coming on the heels of the jobs report that seemed to have everybody spooked at first this morning. But now they're deciding that they like it. The markets are all in the green. S&P up about 1.8%. Uh, trading right around 3875 right now. So back up north of that 3800 level that we've seemed to just been glued to in the last couple of weeks. We rally away from it. Then we come right back. And then we rally away. And we come right back. Then we sell off. And we rally back to it. it seems like 3800 was the glue. Now we are maybe moving away from it. We shall see. Dow also up 1.7%. Uh, NASDAQ up 1.9%. And VIX, as we kicked off the show, was at about a 21 and a quarter. That puts it down about exactly three quarters of a point from where it was this time last week. So I should say last year. And then uh, VIX. VIX starting to get alarmingly low. 73, down another five points. That's a data point that's certainly worth watching, listeners, because if past is prologue, and again, these markets are completely up for grabs, so who knows if the past is even prologue anymore. But if past is prologue in the vol space, then it's not going to hang out here for very long. But as I say that, it continues to erode. So uh, intriguing stuff. Can vol of vol stay this low? Another question we have to wrestle with here into the new year. Let's kick it off. Let's go back to the southern volatility mecca. Uh, Mr. Meatball, as you mentioned at the top of the show, kind of a topsy-turvy kickoff to the year. We're up, we're down. Vol kind of net down here on the heels of today's jobs report. What is catching your eye out there in the vol space this week, sir? Yeah, um, you know, we've got the VIX at the low for the week. (coughs) The Jam VIX future is kind of falling off a cliff. Uh, Back end of the curve is still very, very steep, but um, they are... They are looking at this this market and they are uh, coming after Vol. Although you look, the Feb. I was looking at this. I was talking to Andrew about this earlier. Uh, Vol VVIX. And I know we're going to talk about options here in a little bit, but VVIX is just incredibly cheap. Seventy two eighty five. Um, I can't believe it. And the cost of of options in uh, VIX itself are just so cheap. Um, it, it is not hard to imagine yourself making some money being um, being long some of these puts. Uh, that's that's what I'm seeing. The vol space, vol vol cheap. Uh, that jam front month future pretty inexpensive, and VIX itself low for the week. Yeah, that 73 really leapt off the page at me this morning. That's uh, that's getting into some intriguing territory for Vol of Vol. Mr. Rhodes, same question for you. What is catching your eye in this first trading week of the New Year's? Well, I had um, I, 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 I was looking at I was looking at VDIX and then I was preparing for my weekly's report, the weekly rundown. And I can't believe I, I just anecdotally. I was looking. I, I had so many trades, so many weekly trades to choose among, and it looks like there's a ton of people expecting some sort of spike in, that, that would that would line up with the January 25th expiration. That expiration never feeds into BVIX. So a part of me is wondering if, if, if just like with the index options, if with VIX, this awareness of weeklies is bleeding over into another market. And depending on the month and depending on when the big numbers that we care about are coming out, uh, is, you know, is it going to show up in VVIX or is it not? That's, that's the main question as we continue to see VVIX uh, go the way of the dodo here on the show, listeners. Can we get a 60 handle coming into the second week in VVIX? <laughs> second week of the new year? I mean, this time last year, listeners, we were right around a 110 kicking off the new year. As you'll recall, VIX kicked off the year last year 
at its low for the year, 1630. It never touched that level again. January 3rd of last year was the low for VIX. VIX, though, was still frothy. VIX was around a 110. So we had a very interesting dichotomy then where vol was low, but vol of vol was high. And then we have kind of a bit of a flipping of the script now. Vol higher. It's in the high, in the twenties, of course. And vol of vol is completely anemic. So very much flipping the script from where we were this time a year ago. Of course, it was a big talking point when vol of vol finally broke triple digits for the first time since the start of the pandemic. I believe it was late April, early May of last year when that happened. And we've never really looked back. Haven't really gone back to triple digits since then. Maybe kissed it a few times, but. Uh, intriguing stuff out there from a ball of ball perspective. Let's get out to the land of the future, see if things are intriguing out there. And as you might imagine, VIX Cash coming in, the jobs number out. Uh, the front portion of that futures curve is looking down, down markedly, actually, which is kind of interesting. Also, interestingly, some of the coming more for the second month out contract, the Feb contract, than they are for the Jan contract. As we kicked off the show, the Jan contract was down about one and a half points. Uh, the Feb contract was down nearly two. So coming more for the second month out, you don't traditionally see that in VIX futures. Usually the most flex, the most movement is in that front contract. But uh, again, all bets are off when it comes to <laughs> to the vol market in 2023. Mr. Rhodes, anything catching your eye out there in the land of VIX futures this week, sir? Uh, not particular. I mean, it, it was interesting to me that we started out the year with a pretty normal looking per- uh, VIX term structure, or we finished last year with, and we 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 seem to on a week to week basis over the past uh, handful of weeks, we're finally seeing these parallel shifts that that are kind of boring and difficult to write about. Uh, but we've started to see more and more parallel shifts on the uh, uh, as far as the uh, term structure goes, as opposed to you know flip flopping up back and forth, but never really becoming too inverted, which uh, I. Leads me to leads me to believe maybe we're going to end up in a, a more normal equity type market situation this year, uh, hopefully at least. So that I mean, as far as the term structure, that's the best thing that I can come up with for you at the moment. Uh, we got an interesting question here coming in from the live from Option God. Happy New Year to you, Option God. He says, "Has daily SPX options trading stolen some of the volume away from VIX futures? Why do you need them now?" Well. I can see for a longer term argument, certainly a use case for VIX futures. But you do bring up an interesting point there, option God, because I do have the OCC numbers right in front of me. They just came out for the year just uh, earlier this week, listeners. And one of the few dark spots on the year, there were actually two. There was equity options. They were down 16% from last year. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, But even though overall volume was still explosive, still a record year, almost 10.4 billion contracts. But the other dark spot was futures. Futures were down nearly 6% on the year. Volume in 2021, 58 and a half million, excuse me, this year, 55.1 million. Uh, So I think a lot of people were hoping SVIX and the return of inverse vol was going to kind of juice up some of that volume again. And yet, for whatever reason, we haven't seen it. Maybe your hypothesis is the reason, Option God. Maybe it is the zero DTE. Uh, Mr. Meatball, what do you think of that? The fact that uh, even on another record options volume year, VIX futures continue to struggle to find their footing. And B, what do you think of our, our pro members' suggestion? Maybe it's zero day to blame, sir. Well, I, I think it's uh, a little bit of that. Um, I also think that um, there was just... We didn't get the VIX movement to actually cause um, futures to start blowing up, right? We were very range bound. What were you going to do with VIX futures? There was contango capture. That was really about it. So, um, you know, maybe tangentially, if you consider that, you know, single day options are affecting VIX itself, then then the answer maybe is yes. But um, if you're talking about why was the VIX a little anemic. I think it had more to do with the, the lack of, 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 of movement in VIX itself and the fact that there was really no need to go out and chase VIX futures and to, to go go after them. Most, most of the time you see VIX futures volume blow up when VIX is really moving. And that just was not the case. Now, the previous year was a really active year for VIX as well. So there could be a little bit of that. And then our friends over at Spikes, uh, I'm interested in what maybe some of the uh, whether they had a uh, an effect on uh, on VIX as well. Uh, we know that we've seen uh, an increase in volume in 
spikes, I don't think to the tune of 16 percent of VIX, but I'm sure there was some siphoning off there in spikes. That could certainly be the case as well as we keep on rolling into the big mothership VIX options. Is it an active day? It's somewhat active day. About 387,000 contracts, which looks even better when I tell you the ADV, which has continued to erode, now back below half a million contracts, is down to 498,000. That's down another 19,000 contracts this week. So that seasonality of vol and volume working against VIX over the last couple of weeks. But today, looking a little bit more robust, 387,000. So a good chance we may may break that ADV in the right direction today. And before I start breaking down all the top positions out there in VIX land, he is joining us by the magic of telephone, but he did do his homework, he said. So now, allow me to present to you the first Russell's Weekly Rundown for the new year. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Let's just play it one more time. It's fun. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. <laughs> That's the real reason we have him on the show, listeners, because he comes equipped with one of the best themes in the business. Mr. Rhodes, you got it twice Absolutely. today. <laughs> you got it twice today. What do you got in store for us? How much does it cost us every time you play that? Oh, tons. You don't want to know. You don't want to know. Luckily, a good okay. year for the network we can swing. All right. Okay, you can handle it along with the bandwidth bill. Okay, um, Monday. No, no, I'm, I'm sending you a bill for the bandwidth bills after the show. That's a separate discussion. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm waiting. You know, uh, what, what's a few million dollars a month, friend? Okay, Monday. We weren't open Monday. Tuesday, uh, late day buyer. Uh, in January 25th, expiration seemed to be really focused on this week with the uh, weeklies. Uh, somebody bought about, about 3000 of January uh 25th, 26 calls for a buck 10. And as I went through the tape, I think maybe there was a consistent buyer throughout the day. It just looked like somebody kept hitting the uh, offer just uh, periodically throughout the day. Uh, and then somebody also bought the uh, 28 call, the January 20, 25th, 28 calls and sold the 60 calls for January 25th. Uh, spent 51 cents on that. Again, looking for a spike on Wednesday. Uh, I saw this trade several times where somebody was buying 200 of the January, again, January 25th, uh, 32 calls and selling the 35 calls. Uh, this lot was a 200 lot for 11 cents. Uh, there are a bunch of them like in a dime and an 11 cent range uh, through the course of Wednesday afternoon. And then uh, a one by two, somebody bought five of the January 11th, 27 calls. And paid 18 cents for them, sold twice as many of the 32 calls for six cents each, net cost of six cents per one by two spread. Um, and I think it's okay up to about 37 or so. Uh, you know, VIX doesn't go to 40 anymore. So maybe that looks like a, a safe trade. And there's a, there's a sarcasm asterisk when I said that. People don't, you know, I don't want to hear next week when VIX got to 45 that somebody bet the farm on it not hitting 40. Because uh, it still can, it just hasn't. Uh, yesterday, uh, somebody again buying a call spread in January 25th expiration, buying the 26 calls, selling the 31 calls, paid 43 cents for that. Um, somebody sold the January 11th 21 puts, and then this is our this is our favorite trade: selling the puts and buying a call spread. Sold the January 11th 21 puts, and then bought the 24 calls and sold the 26 calls on January 11th. When you put all that together, they paid eight cents for it. Uh, so they're okay as long as we stay above 21, and they're happy if we spike up to the uh, the mid 20s. And then today, you know, it was all bullish, bullish, bullish. Today, uh, the the biggest trade I saw was somebody buying the January 11th 24 puts for 228 each. So somebody expecting uh, depressed volatility over the next two three days. I like it. One by twos, all kinds of fun in the weekly this week. Kinds. And, you know, Russell, I look forward to uh, the day, maybe coming soon, when Zero DTE also takes over VIX, in which case the entire show will be Russell's Weekly Rundown. And you could just take it over and I'll, I'll go do my own thing for an hour. <laughs> Imagine the volume then. My goodness. Serious, serious business out there. But some serious action out here, even in this first holiday trading week of the year. Uh, still some action out there. Like I said, 387,000 contracts on the tape today. Uh, let's break down the top 10 of how we're looking from a position perspective uh, coming into the new year. About 8.5 million contracts open in VIX right now. Not heavy, not light, kind of right in that middle 
that Goldilocks range there. Cost you about 102,000 contracts to break into VIX. Right now, that is kind of light. But that gets you to the Jan 24 puts. Uh, number nine, 105,000. By the way, there are now eight to two calls over puts out there. So one more put sneaking into our top 10 since the end of last year. Number nine, 105,000 of the Jan 35. So again, we're starting off with some pretty normal, dare I say it, reasonable paper. Maybe that's a sign of what's to come. We shall see. Uh, number eight, oh, our old friends, the June 15, still there, 107,000 of those bad boys. I may have a few of those. I think the meatball may have. Everyone's got some of those. That's just the strike du jour out uh, there. Number seven, a buck 16 of the Jan 25 calls. Number six, 138,000 of the Feb 60s. Now we're starting to get back to it, listeners. Number five, 161,000 of the March 80s. All right, here we go. Number four, 170,000 of the Feb 70s. Number three, a buck 72 of the Feb 80s. Number two, 210,000 of the March 75s. And the number one size position in VIX options right now, 233,000 of the Jan 70 calls. So a lot of action out there. Let's see what kind of action was hitting us this week. Then we'll get uh, the meatballs take on all this paper out here. Today, like we said, not bad paper, 387,000 contracts on the tape as of the start of this segment. The big dog today, 27,000 of the Feb 30. So again, Feb 30, not a bad strike. Number two, 23,000 of the Jan 70s. Now here we go right back at it. Number three, 22,000 of the Feb 23 puts. Number four, 22,000 as well of the Jan 20 puts. And number five, uh, 20,000 of the weekly Jan 21 puts expiring next Friday. So I want to Russell's weekly rundown trades there. Yesterday, similar paper, 358,000 contracts. Everyone was maybe keeping some of their powder dry coming into the number this morning. The big dog, such as it was yesterday, 17,000 of the Jan 27s. Number two, 16,000 of the Feb 30s. Number three, 15,000 of the Jan 28s. Number four, 15,000 as well of the March 21 puts. And rounding out the top five on a kind of light day, 15,000 of the April 21 Puts. Interesting. April 21 puts. I wonder what, what those are going for. I'll have to pull those up. Wednesday, similar level, 367,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, the big dog, such as it was, 45,000 of the Feb 70s. So those persist, listeners, followed by number two, 21,000 of the Jan 32 halves. Number three, back to the weeklies again, 20,000 of the Jan 21 puts expiring next Friday. Number four, we've got, uh, no, excuse me, next Friday. <laughs> Even I'm going crazy. Next Wednesday, of course. Number four, we got 15,000 of the Jan 22 puts. And number five, 15,000 as well of the Jan, excuse me, Feb 32 calls. Feb 22 puts for number, for number four and Feb 32 calls for number five. And then rounding out a not that active week, but something, something on the tape. Tuesday, a little bit of action, 521,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, the big dog was actually pretty sizable on Tuesday, 50,000 pretty much exactly of the May 65s. I haven't seen a ton of upside percolate yet in May. Maybe this is the beginning of it. Number two, 38,000 of the Jan 20 puts. Number three, 31,000 of the Jan 30 calls. Number four, 25,000 of the Jan 21 puts. And rounding out the top five on pretty much the most active day of the week, at least so far, 21,000 of the Jan 28 calls Monday, obviously closed here for the New Year's holiday. Mr. Meatball, Russell ran down some weekly paper. I just ran down the rest of the size paper in VIX options. Anything catching your eye in VIX options to kick off our first trading week, sir? Yeah, you know, um, pretty anemic. Uh, I've been kind of surprised. We haven't seen some big put buyers step in and try and go long. Uh, we did see some of those one by two traders back in there. Like today, they're buying June 85 calls and Jan. I mean, there's even some Jan 70s on the tape. Uh, I do like the, the, uh, we did have a kind of a ratio put spread buyer, bought like the 20, the Feb 25s, sell the Feb 23s, got some Jan, I, and these are cheap. The Jan 20 puts are 24 cents. Uh, those went up, uh, against the, uh, the 22 puts. So there's, there's paper today. It's just nothing, nothing really like crazy. We haven't seen any like massive trades in a very long time uh, in the VIX. Um, not last week, not the previous week. Uh, could be uh, so, you know, just kind of anemic, an anemic week for trading. 
everyone keeping their powder dry. People still on vacation, coming back from the holidays. A lot of people maybe still stuck in their vacation destination due to the, the travel backlog here in the U.S. Let's keep rolling out to Russell's favorite Vol product. At least he's one of the more vocal proponents of it out there. SVIX. A lot of people weren't that enthused by it last year. Didn't really maybe deliver what they wanted, except for Russell. He loved it, even though it pretty much ended the year almost literally unched from where it launched at the end of March. I think a couple a couple of fractions of a point difference there. So not a lot of net bang for your buck in SVIX, but along the way, a little bit of a different story. SVIX right now, 15 and a half, up 1.1 points. So getting a little bit of love out there today. Uh, 2,400 contracts also on the tape today. So that's that's not nothing, especially when you consider the ADB is only 800. So some paper obviously going up out there today. Let's look really quickly and see what's lighting it up. Looks like a 6-7 put vertical in February has gone up 500 times. So that's obviously 1,000 of those contracts. Followed by what looks like a Feb 15-16 call vertical gone up about 460 times. So maybe a bit of a, an iron condor out there. I don't know. I'll have to go pull it up and check and see. The size is pretty close. And strike-wise, it's an interesting one. You like that, listeners? The... The Feb 6-7 put and 15-16 call iron condor in SVIX. That's an intriguing one. Let me just look really quickly if I can see what the... Looks like they're selling the six puts. I have them both. I think they're both going up for a nickel. So <laughs> kind of hard to read uh, too much into that noise there. Intriguing stuff. Mr. Rhodes, uh, you've been the the most outspoken proponent on the network for SVIX. I think you're, you're to quote you, you said, I love it more than my own children. Uh, what is it about SVIX that's bringing you to the table? And what are your thoughts on on its action so far this year, sir? Well, right. I just want to clarify. It's more than one of my children. Oh, okay. Yes. Not yes. both of them. Okay. <laughs> and, and we won't we won't go beyond that. No, I think it's I think it's a great way for uh, people to get long. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, short volatility exposure. Um, you know, it, it much like uh, VXX, which got launched when VIX was at. Uh, VIX was at 20. I'm sorry, VIX was at 50 the day that VXX launched. Uh, they kind of, you know, everybody said, well, they suffered from launching when we had a high VIX. Uh, you know, SVIX launched in a year that was kind of difficult to be short ball, but it's a good long term strategy. Uh, I have, a, I, we know the guys that, that are behind this. I, you know, I know them personally. I have a lot of confidence that they've constructed it in a way that we're not going to have a repeat of an XIV type situation. And uh, the only thing, my only uh, problem with SVIX is I really wish we had weekly options. I mean, I know yeah, it, it's that you know cart before the horse and all that kind of stuff, and we need volume to justify getting the weekly options. But I would love to be able to, instead of just selling the monthly calls every once in a while against my position, uh, be able to be a little bit more dynamic around it. Uh, but I, I, I just, you know, it's... Short volatility is a long-term profitable strategy, and if you have a long time horizon, there's nothing wrong with being invested in, you know, SVXY if you don't if you only want half the exposure or SVIX. And I'm real happy that we have something that gives us 100% exposure that we didn't have until they relaunch or launched that one and brought a new one out. You mentioned some of the other Vol products. We are kind of coming up against it, so we'll kind of do a, a grab bag here at the end and get Mr. Meatball's thoughts as well. Uvix the Cousin product, I suppose you can call it. Launched at the same time. A very different beast, though, than SVIX. UVIX had about a 515 down, nearly a full point, 0.85 points when we kicked off the show out there. It is winning in the race to zero ahead of UVXY. UVXY at six and a quarter when we kicked off the show, down about three quarters of a point. Still, as far as I've seen, no, no reverse split info out there. But who knows? It could have come as we're talking here on the show uh, UVIX is starting to do a little bit more paper out there. The ADB is about 5,500 contracts. And today we saw about 5,000 already on the tape. So a little bit of action out there. Let's look really quickly and see what the big dog is. Uh, 1,400 of the Jan 6 puts have gone up today. These are the ones expiring next week. So these are the weeklies. And then uh, 1,300 of the Jan 6 half puts. Looks like maybe a bit of a put roll out there. And again, going back to Russell's point. Does seem like the weeklies and the weekly expiration cycle does drive a lot of the paper out here and some of these other products like UVIX. So that could probably help with SVIX out there as well. Uh, UVXY, six and a quarter, like we said, in terms of paper out there today, was looking pretty good. 127,000 contracts at the tape to start the show, up to 170,000. Now it's almost up to its ADV, which is 192. That actually is moving in the wrong direction, down 13,000 from last week. But then again, it was the end of the year. No one expects volume uh, to blow the doors out 
here today. In terms of the top positions in UBXY, the big dog are the Jan 10 calls, 27,000 of those, followed by 22,000 for number two of the Jan 75s. And then number three is 20,000 exactly of the Jan expiring today, the sixth, seven calls. So uh, intriguing. Good luck to you, sir, if uh, <laughs> who has 20,000 of those bad boys out there. Maybe you overrode them aggressively. Who knows? And then our old friend VXX, uh, thirteen thirty when we kicked off the show, down a full point. We had about 48,000 contracts on the tape when we kicked off the show. That's up to about 56,000 now. Uh, the ADV is 61,000. That's down 7,000 from where it was this time last week. So VXX does continue to give up paper, but maybe it will start to to break that trend out there. In terms of top positions, the big dog in VXX right now, 36,000 of the Jan 15 calls. All right, Mr. Meatball, a lot to unpack there. Uh, pretty much the rest of the Vol ETP universe. We got UVIX, we got UVXY, both racing each other to zero. Uh, we've got VXX trying to make itself relevant again. Anything catching your eye out there in those products this week, sir? Yeah, I mean, uh, volume in VXX is picking up, and that is, I think, pretty interesting. And we're seeing a uh, volume in, in UVIX also continue to increase as people realize that that's the more interesting trading product. So, uh, yeah, there there's definitely some some things going on. VXX, is, it, the volume there in the options is really starting to heat up. There we go. Maybe it's unbroken again. We shall see. Are you folks trading? We got Nichols in our live chat saying he can never trust VXX again. Yeah, I feel you. A lot of, a lot of people out there, I think, have that same sentiment. You know, uh, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you kind of thing. And VXX has fooled us all many more times than twice at this point. So maybe there's a little bit of that. You know, I'm just going to look at other products at this point because you don't want another debacle unfolding. You know, it's never a debacle, listeners. It's always fun. It's the crystal ball. So let's get to it. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, everybody, welcome to the crystal ball, the first crystal ball for the new year. I paid off the results for our crystal ball contest. On the last show of the year, I'll just run them down for the meatball, Mr. Rhodes, who wore in here. Uh, I took it with six. The meatball had two. Andrew had, I think, somewhere between one to two. I don't know why his numbers aren't here, but he was, as I recall, somewhere in that range as well. Uh, Matt Amberson, in terms of guests, took it with two crystal ball victories of his own. And Russell had one. So Russell did get his name on the board at least last year. But Matt did take the guest crown, hence why he joined us on the final Vol Views of the year over there, which was a fun one. Check it out if you haven't. As well, listeners, we also did our poll for end of the year vol. It was that time of year again, listeners. We asked you quite simply, where do you think VIX will close at the end of 2023? This was our broad poll. We also asked you folks to write in with your specific guesses to win fabulous prizes. Our poll this year was gave you four choices. Explosive, so north of 26. You pretty much moved everything up a point from where it was last year. Remember, this time last year, we were in the teens. So moved it up a little bit, make it more fun for you. Explosive, north of 26. Juicy, 21 to about 26. Mildly frothy, 16 to 21. Or snooze fest, below 16. And the poll went out with about 34% of you choosing mildly frothy. So once again, last year you picked the similar range, about 16, I think, to 20 it was. And this year, or it was 15 to 20, I think. And then 16 to 21 was the range this year. So you folks are still firmly entrenched in the teens out there, followed by 25% for Juicy, 21 to 26, uh, 24% for Explosive, north of 26, and 16.9% saying it's going to be a snooze fest, uh, below 16. I bring all that around, listeners, to say to my two cohorts here, and not only this week do you have to pick Vol for next week, but also you must pick your end-of-year Vol guess. I will also have to reveal my own now. Uh, let's see. By the way, it was me and Matt on the show last week. I was at a 21.45, and holy crap, 21.37. Uh, <laughs> kicking off the new year with my first bullseye of the year there. Not bad at all. I'll take that. I'll take all the bullseyes I can get. Matt was at a 22. So he was pretty close as well. Not bad for him, but not within our tenth of a point margin of victory out there. Uh, Frank, you were pretty close, 2120. Not bad for you. Pretty close, 0.17 away. But uh, not enough for the bullseye, Frank. You know it's a tough, tough game. A bunch of other people wrote in. Our producers will 
follow up with you if anyone else got within a tenth of a point. So I'll take it. First, first show of the year, Bullseye. I will take that. That's a good omen for the year to come. And now I will choose. I will choose to have you folks go first because that's always fun for me as well uh, to see you guys squirm a little bit. Mr. Rhodes, I think we'll start with you. Where are you feeling for Vol this time next week? And then also we need your Vol, your Vix end of year prediction, sir, a twofer. Okay. Well, I, I've written over the holiday, I wrote an econometric model that projects out VIX based on 72 different factors that I have come up with because I've decided that now is the time that I have to start to take this seriously and stop being a punching bag. So my, uh, my, my estimate is 20.234. It goes out three digits for, um, for this week. And I ran it for the year in 16.97 at the end of the year. So 20.23. You're adding decimal points to yourselves now. You're adding more challenge. Well, it's, what the, it's what the model did. I'm, an, I'm just 20.23. And what was your end of, year, end of year 16 what? 97. 16.97 for end of the year. 20.23. For this. Can, can, I, can I throw a curveball at you because it's the first day of the year? Sure. Why not? How about an average for the year? Sure. If you, if you want to give one, go ahead. <laughs> I, I've made you guys speechless so many times today. This will be the last time I'm on until like March or April. Uh, just, Jim Carroll like, also suggested we pick a VIX, I think, uh, high for the year. And I said, that's great. You can, but mm-hmm. the, the cash prize comes from him. So if anyone wants to collect that, that comes from Jim Carroll. So Russell will be giving you the VIX okay. average prize, which I believe is $1 million in cash. I will. No, no, I'll give out. I, I've written a couple of books on VIX. I'll give away uh, a book on VIX. If somebody, All right, if, listeners, if you want to run a contest give out, we'll put out a VIX, a VIX average, a VIX average for the year yeah. as well out there. If you want to give yours, Mr. Rhodes, have at it. 1950. All right, VIX, I got to find a new place to Do put this now because I, I don't have a section for VIX average, but I'll put it here. VIX average. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rhodes, gumming up the works here as usual. 1950, he says. All right. Uh, all right, Mr. Meatball, a lot to follow up there, sir. What is your vol prognostication for next week? And what is your end of the year? And then if you want to give an average, have at it. Sir. Uh, all right. For next week, uh, I'm going to say 23.32. And for the end of the year, I actually have my own proprietary model that I run uh, that goes out to the 18th decimal point. Um, so I'm going to say 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18 for the end of the year. And if you want to mull over the average a little bit, I'll, I'll let you can do it next week or something. Cause Oh no, I got a good, I'll, I'll bet the average. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Uh, what did Russell say? 1970. He said 1950. Good. That's going to be pretty good. Um, I'm going to go a little bit lower, uh, and I'm going to say it's going to be more like, uh, oh, hmm, 1950. And, Russell, this is average closing price we're going to try to do? or Yeah. That, that what we're basing it off of? Okay. There's a lot of different ways we can yeah. go with this. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go with – actually, I'll go, you know what? I think we're going to have some days – I think – the front end of the year could be, could show us an, uh, some high, high ball. So I'm actually going to go with 21.12. Ah, you're, you're stomping all over my average. All right. So 21.12 for the meatballs average. He still keeps it palindromic and also one of the best rush albums out there. So there we go. A twofer there. All right, listeners, that's you. Do you have a guess for the average? Hit us up. Uh, let us know. I guess we'll add this to the mix. And Russell will be handing the prizes, a book, and then I believe a million dollars worth of your crypto of choice, Bitcoin, ETH, whatever you want. All right. For this time next week, uh, nice bullseye this week. I'm liking it. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't hate where I am, but I'm going to go a little lower. You guys are both in the 20s. I'm going to give myself a little bit of breathing room. I'm going to say uh, to the dark side, maybe we go 1936. There we go for next week. And my uh, end of year prediction, I already wrote it down here while these two were were yabbering away. I think 
I think we're going to be a little bit higher than a lot of people think. Again, end of the year is always a crazy time. The last week of the year could gum up all the works. I'm going to say we end up going out, though, north of a 20. I'm going to say a 21.35. That puts me above just about everybody, I think, except uh, I think Passarelli was at 22 half. Other than that, I think everybody else was in a teen. So I'm the lone man on the totem pole out there. And for my average, huh, average closing price for the year for 2023, that's a... That's an interesting one. I think we are going to flirt with the 20s for much of this year. Uh, 22 is high, though. I'm going to... And I don't rub the teens either. This is a tough one. I'm going to say... I'm going to say 2067. So 20 and two-thirds for my average closing price for the year. That's a fun one, listener. So if you have one to guess for that as well, get it on in. All right. That music means we have run a little long, but we were having fun here on the show. Listen, that's going to do it for volatility views for this week. But before we go, let's go around the horn. Mr. Meatball, if folks want to debate with you, your many palindromic vol picks, where should they go? What should they do? Go to optionpit.com. I'm writing up VIX and vol stuff there every day. Uh, You can find out about all kinds of fun stuff, like why there's no skew. Uh, And uh, check it out. I will uh, looking forward to it. Russell, good to catch up. Mr. Rhodes, where should folks go if they want to check out more of your works, sir? Just follow me on Twitter. Anything I do, I always tweet it out. And if you follow um, Insider on Twitter, you'll see I've been linked there a few times today. So it's really easy to find my Twitter. Yep. If you follow us, you can find Mr. Rose. Don't worry about spelling his names, all the S's, all the L's, all that fun stuff over there. But uh, good follow over there on the old Twitters. I do see some of our pro folks starting to chime in with their with their averages now. It's starting to resonate. We got a 20.2 from Z2313, which is close to mine. I don't hate that. I could see how you're kind of struggling with that a little bit. We got a bunch of guesses for next week. So we'll get all those collated so that um, we'll know who the winner is for next week. Fabulous prizes await to those of you. Thanks for joining us for the first show of the new year, listeners. That will conclude our broadcast week for all of our on-demand listeners. For all of our pro folks, stay strapped in. We'll be back in a little bit. I know the Rock Lobster is raring to go. He's sending me all sorts of trades as we're doing the show here. So he's excited. I know uh, Matt from Warads was on one show last year. He's already a convert to Oatly. He's sending me pictures about that. So a lot of fun to be had coming up on Options Oddities in just a few minutes. If you don't know where to find that, listeners, head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. And we'll see you all back here next Friday, another episode of Volatility Views. Stay safe out there, everybody. Volatility Views is brought to you by NASDAQ. From its inception, NASDAQ has been an innovator and agent of change in the financial markets. It's in our DNA, from the development of electronic trading to our drive to bring enhanced functionality and world-leading technology to our suite of six options exchanges. We exemplify customer focus, consistent technology, and streamlined solutions. Now NASDAQ is proud to launch the NASDAQ 100 Volatility Index, ticker symbol VOLQ, to its suite of exchange indexes. VOLQ uses only at-the-money options to provide a precise measure of NASDAQ 100 volatility. Learn more about this exciting new volatility product at www.nasdaq.com slash VOLQ. NASDAQ, leading the U.S. options market and continually rewriting tomorrow. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>